Uh, welcome to another episode of the Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Medicine podcast. And we're here in Melbourne at the World Federation of Nuclear Medicine and, Bi- and Biology. And one thing that I haven't covered enough, and that's my fault, I uh, haven't covered enough in the, uh, in the podcast, is, is uh, musculoskeletal work. And um, I just went to the most packed session of the whole meeting so far. I think they were going to call the fire marshals out because they, because the, every seat was taken and people were coming out the door um, uh, that dealt with musculoskeletal uh, nuclear medicine. In particular, uh, we, we saw an excellent talk on spines and, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Uh, Parathman, uh, you did a, a great talk on, on knee uh, spec CT. And I think uh, what impressed me most was was how you took it to another level. I hate to say it, but traditionally in bone scans, people said, oh, yes, there's increased uptake in X, and that's the report. Yeah. <laughs> right? And I, don't think, I think you said, no, we really need to do this a lot better. Um, and I thought that was very impressive. Uh, um, before we start, though, tell us a bit about your background. Tell us a bit about where you're from. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm a radiologist by sort of training and uh, specialised in nuclear medicine and particularly with the hybrid imaging. Uh, I've been working in sort of a number of different hospitals. So I've worked in a sort of district general hospital doing lots and lots of bread and butter imaging. Um, and now I'm working at the Royal Free in a more specialist centre, but still seeing a lot of bone scanning uh, and spec CT imaging as well. Right. And I, I think um, uh, one of the things you talked about, you went actually, you didn't just talk about interpreting images. What you also did started off with, which I think was particularly important, was how you acquire the images and how you set them up. Um, tell us a little bit about, the, like, for example, the topograms and the other things you did, did to set it up. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think one thing that I noticed that we're moving from planar bone scintigraphy to spec CT, um, we need to optimise the CT uh, to give us the pros- best possible imaging quality. So, you know, typically when you get your spec C- brand new spec CT scanner, the company will come along and set up a few protocols. The CT that you're using for your spec CT might be a standard sort of either a low dose CT that's just there for an- uh, anatomical localization and attenuation correction. But actually, particularly when we're looking at the extremities, we need to do something that's uh, a much higher quality. And so what I started off with doing is just looking at our standard diagnostic CT protocols and applying those to our spec CTs. Because one of the things that I found was that our surgeons were saying, well, that's great, you can do a spec CT, but I still need a diagnostic CT for surgical planning. So I was like, well, there's no point repeating that. So that's why we tried to to incorporate that. And then once you start incorporating a a good quality uh, diagnostic CT, then it's the next step forward to say, well, what else can we do with that CT? What other information can we get from the CT that adds to how we interpret the, the bone scan and the spec part of it? So that's where I started looking at component position and looking at what value we could get from uh, looking at component position on the CT. So that's where I've added in uh, long length topograms, looking at the knee, so we can measure the component position relative to the mechanical axis, which is the weight bearing axis for the, for the leg and uh, allows us to uh, understand exactly the biomechanics and, and the knee. Right, so, so you can look at the alignment and you do it in two planes. You, know, you make sure that the other knee isn't in the road when you do the lateral and those sorts that's of things, right, which I yeah. thought was an important aspect. I mean, a lot of those little details matter, don't they? I think. That's right, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, obviously, uh, there is some training and education involved, not just for us uh, interpreting the images, but for our technologists, because um, they need to understand when they're acquiring the images why they're acquiring those images and why they're doing the extra topograms, why they have to move flex the contralateral knee so and explain that to the patient when they're doing the procedures so there is some education that's involved um, and I, hopefully i think if if more people are sort of trying the techniques then um, this will become a bit more common practice right and, and other things like extending the ct scale and those sorts of things to deal with metal and uh and and using the right settings and the right uh the right filters and so on in terms of, in terms of your reconstruction i think that was important the other thing i thought you made a difference was in terms of the reconstruction you've had two sets of reconstructions right that's right so as well as the standard reconstructions uh one of the crucial things is when we do the reconstructions we reconstruct according to the anatomical planes so the st- 
most scanners will just churn out some axial, coronal, and sagittal images. But actually, when we're looking at musculoskeletal imaging, it has to be relative to the joints that we're looking at. Um, and that helps when we're interpreting it. It also helps when we're presenting the images for our orthopedic colleagues, because it looks like something that they'd be expecting to see from an MRI, for instance. Right. So when we, when we do, for instance, the knees, we uh, angle the coronal plane relative to the femoral condyles gotcha. uh, to make it look so that it looks straight essentially. Right. Um, the other reconstruction we do is we do a small field of view. Right. So if you look at a diagnostic CT, they will usually scan one limb at a time. So they will have naturally have a small field of view concentrating on the one knee that maybe they're interested in. Uh, what we're doing in uh, nuclear medicine is we typically scan both the, both limbs. We, we have do, to we, for attenuation, Chris. Exactly. Right. So we do that anyway. So. Um, so one of the complaints that we were receiving is the images that we see on the CT weren't as good as the ones that we're getting on the diagnostic CT. And that can't be true when you've got the same imaging parameters. Right. And one of the things I realise is probably because we're using a large field of view. Right. So zooming in, just exactly, it just makes it, makes it too big. So uh, having a smaller field of view tight around the, 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 the knee that we're interested in gives really nice detailed images. You know, I don't understand why... Um why CTs don't have the flexibility in terms of being able to um, modify your voxel size and things like that in the same way we do with SPECT. I still haven't figured, quite figured that one out in terms yeah. of the parameters in terms of how to do that, but I think that was quite important. And the other things you looked at was, was the, the sequence of way you do the bone scan. Um, uh, uh, what, what components of the bone scan did you say? A lot of this is standard a lot of places, but I thought you know, it was worthwhile putting in. Yeah, I think, um, so we do a fairly straightforward bone scan. So we do a three-phase bone scan. We do a dynamic phase, we do a blood pool phase of the knees, and then we always do a whole body as well. I think it's useful to, we've had some debates about whether it's, it's, it adds value, um, but I think, you know, uh, particularly with the large joints like the hips and the knees, you often get referred pain from the pelvis and from the spine. And I think having a whole body image just to sort of assess the rest of the, the skeleton is, is an important aspect. And then we usually go on to do the spec CT of the knees and that. Right. Now, uh, a lot of the discussion, of course, goes on around whether you have, whether it's uh, particularly in, in, in knee surgery, whether it's loosening, whether it's infection, or whether it's something else. And I think mm -hmm. one of the important things you put was the something else. And so uh, could you talk us through a little bit about, about some take-home messages along, along, uh, along with the knee interpretation? Yeah, so I think... Um, so one of the things is traditionally in nuclear medicine, we're used to sort of being asked, is this infection or loosening? And, and pretty much that's all you can say. Um, certainly the spec CT adds another dimension to the diagnosis and what we can, what the value that we can add to the clinical diagnosis. Um, I think we still use it a lot to exclude infection. Um, and certainly a negative bone scan from that point of view, it has a high negative predictive value and we can confidently exclude infection in, in those situations. The difficulty we often have is when you've got a, an abnormal bone scan, you've got increased uptake and trying to differentiate aseptic loosening, infection and the other uh, causes of pain uh, can be tricky and that's where the spec CT really helps. So, you know, for instance, if we're seeing uh, diffuse uptake around the prosthesis that sometimes suggests infection, particularly when you've got uh, increased flow on the dynamic and blood pressure right, phase right. images. Um, but the CT really helps uh, clinch the diagnosis because one of the hallmark features of infection is uh, the periosteal reaction gotcha. uh, and the new bone formation. And I've seen lots of cases of aseptic loosening where there's quite extensive bone destruction. Uh, the prosthesis and the bone around it has collapsed. Um, but actually you don't see the new bone formation that you see with an infection and actually that can sometimes help differentiate those two. Right. And even if, even if you're not seeing infection or uh, loosening, uh, some of the other more common causes of pain are related to the patellofemoral joint. Right. So it's, it's useful to assess the uh, patella to see whether there's been a resurfacing or not. Right. Um, that can be a slightly controversial issue. Um, in some countries, certainly in the UK, we only tend to resurface the patella if there's uh, anterior knee pain at the time of surgery. But I know uh, in the US, it's a lot more common to resurface the patella uh, as a primary procedure. Um, and certainly,
certainly if you're getting uh, focal uptake in the patella uh, that hasn't been resurfaced, then patella femoral degeneration is probably a, a, a particular concern there. Um, and when you do see that, it is worth assessing the component position uh, and looking for some of those ancillary features uh, that might suggest a patella femoral uh, degeneration, such as patella uh, maltracking um, and uh, malalignment uh, and patella, a low lying patella, patella barger, uh, as well as other features such as synovitis and uh, synovial effusion. Right, so, so you really want to be, uh, be concentrating on some of these other indicator features. Do, do, does anything in terms of positioning help in terms of, in terms of doing that, in terms of trying to find those, particularly with the patella? So particularly with the patella, one of the, one of the causes for um, either uh, patella component loosening or even patella degeneration is, is hyperflexion of the femoral component. Right. Uh, and I think that's quite useful because that can be assessed on the topograms, along those topograms. Gotcha. Um, and, and can contribute to sort of focal uptake in the patella. Um, so it, although the treatment is still going to be a patella resurfacing, at least it gives the, the surgeon an indication of patella, perhaps why this has occurred. You talked then about getting in, uh, in contact with the surgeon. Do you think that sort of communication is useful in these sorts of processes? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's essential for us as, uh, as, uh, as radiologists and nuclear medicine physicians interpreting the images. Um, it's very difficult to keep up with the changes in the types of prostheses and, right. um, and the techniques that are being used. And you probably find in your own practice that you have a group of surgeons who do things a certain way uh, and that might not be the same as a neighbouring practice where they have uh, different groups of surgeons. So I think having that done, that conversation and that sort of uh, communication with your surgeons is essential because they will tell you that, you know, they always use this type of prosthesis and they often see these kind of complications that right. are related. And it might be the material of the prosthesis, not, not just whether it's loosened or whether it's... Would that be a fair comment? I think that's... Uh, we, well, we see that particularly with uh, the hip replacements, and we've seen with the metal-on-metal metal hip replacements, you've got uh, high uh, rates of um, metallosis and metal reactions, uh, less so with the knee replacements, right. but we do see... You, you will see um, osteolysis and reactions as a, uh, as a result of some inflammatory process related to any component of the, the prosthesis. So is there anything else you'd add that would be a good take-home message for, for nuclear medicine physicians or technologists or other people in this area? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think just generally that, you know, spec CT uh, in uh, orthopaedic uh, procedures is, is essential. Right. I think the, the, there is a significant value added to seeing the CT, uh, not just sort of is there uptake or isn't there, um, knowing where the uptake is, but also understanding uh, the biomechanics. Right. Um, it's, it's, it, that is the reason we find it so difficult to understand why we're seeing uptake uh, in, in a prosthesis or in any joint is because we don't really understand the biomechanics and that's the value that can be uh, added by looking at the CT. Gotcha, yes. So the, the biomechanics might mean that you, they've got pain in one knee but you've got something that you're seeing uptake in the other knee and maybe absolutely. That's, uh, that's to do with that sort, of, that, that sort of feature. Yeah, absolutely. And similarly, we see sort of patients who present with knee pain but actually it's coming from the, the hip or the, the, the lumbar sacral spine or uh, anywhere else. Right. Oh, that, that's really useful information. And, and uh, I thought your talk was great and I really appreciate, appreciate your input and uh, thank you a lot for being part of the podcast. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Yes.